We're going to start looking at some of the species of gram-negative bacteria in this video. So if we take a look at this evolutionary tree, we've got LUCA here, our last universal common ancestor at the bottom. And then as we have our first branching here, these are the bacteria, domain bacteria. And here's the gram-positive bacteria. All of the others are all going to be gram-negative bacteria. And we're going to start by looking at the proteobacteria, which is actually the largest taxonomic group of all the bacteria. So I just want you just to know that name, proteobacteria. And you realize that that's the largest taxonomic group of all the bacteria. And then the proteobacteria are divided into five different taxonomic classes. They're just named after Greek letters. You do not have to memorize any of these. So I will not ask you like which bacteria is an alpha proteobacteria or which bacteria is even a proteobacteria. I will not ask you that. I will also not ask you which bacteria is gram-negative and which one's gram-positive. I'm just going to ask you, you know, the name of the bacteria. I won't even make you spell it. It'll just be like multiple choice. You can pick out the name. And I just want you to know what's in red on the slides. So that's all you have to know. So and I think that's enough for right now. And when you get into your healthcare classes, you can get into a lot more detail with these. All right, so our first group of proteobacteria we're going to take a look at, um, we're going to be in the class of alpha proteobacteria, which you don't need to memorize. But we're just going to take a look at two of them. So we've got rickettsia. And the other one we're going to look at is rhizobium. Okay, and there are others in this group, but we're not going to look at them. We just don't have time to look at everything. Let's take a look at the rickettsial bacteria first. These are what we call obligate intracellular parasites. Obligate means required. Intracellular is inside the cell, so that just means that they're required to live inside of our cells, so they can't survive very long outside of the cells. And then parasites just is talking about that symbiotic relationship where they will benefit while our cells are going to be harmed. So they're not going to be very nice to us. How they're going to be transmitted to us is through the bite of an arthropod. And if you look on the bottom right, here are some different types of arthropods that can be infected with the rickettsial bacteria, and then when they bite you, they can transmit the bacteria to you, and that's how you get infected with these rickettsial bacteria. So what kind of symptoms are you going to get if you get infected with the rickettsia bacteria? So they will cause a spotted fever. So what do we mean by that? So if you look at the picture on the bottom left, you can see that the spotting is referring to the rash that is caused on your skin by the bacteria. And then it also will cause a fever. So that's where spotted fever comes from. So just kind of put that in your brain somewhere. The rickettsial bacteria, they cause spotted fevers. There are different species of rickettsia, which you do not have to memorize. I will not ask you that. So I'll just say rickettsia and that's all you need to know. Okay, but there are different species. So like Rickettsia prowazekii, that one is spread through the bite of white, or sorry, lice. And here is a louse down here. Uh, lice are very specific. So like human lice only will bite humans and they won't, um, you know, bite other animals and, and you can't get like, um, you know, dog lice or cat lice, you know, and be infected with that. So they have their own lice. So 
So human lice, if they bite and suck the blood of someone who is infected with this rickettsial species, and they pick that bacteria up, then they bite the next person, that's how you get infected. So this will cause typhus, and typhus is a pretty serious disease. It does cause a spotted fever, and the fever can get really high, and it makes you pretty delirious, and you don't think straight. And that word typhus means hazy, and it's just talking about how you're pretty delirious and you're not thinking straight at all. So typhus is, um, we see more in people that are crowded together because that's how lice can spread e easily from one person to the next. So like sometimes we see this spreading like in refugee camps. Um, the other place that we saw this spreading was in concentration camps, um, like during World War II. So probably the one of the more famous uh, people that died of typhus was Anne Frank. Our next species of rickettsia is rickettsia typhi. This one is not as serious as the typhus spread by lice, because the typhus spread by lice, up to 60% of the people will die from it. Whereas the murine typhus, uh, this one is spread by rat fleas. Here's a, a flea right here, um, kind of on the top right there. And this one will also cause a spotted fever, but you're not going to get as sick and um, the mortality rate is not nearly as high as, as the epidemic typhus is. And then the other one that um, we can have problems with that is a little bit closer to home here is this last one, rickettsia, rickettsii. This one causes Rocky Mountain spotted fever, and that one is spread through tick bites. So there's a tick down there on the bottom right. And that one also, obviously with the name, causes a spotted fever. All right, so let's just take a look at what the rickettsia bacteria look like. So there's a picture on the left here of the bacterial cell, and you can see that on the Outside of the bacterial cell, it does have a slime layer. And remember, the slime layer is part of the glycocalyx, and it's made out of carbohydrates or sugars. And this is there for protection, helps it stick to the cells, and also can be used for motility, help it to kind of slide along. And then the picture on the right is just showing you a chicken embryo cell and you can see that it's been infected with lots of rickettsial bacteria inside here. And that's because these rickettsial bacteria, they have to live inside the cells. They don't actually survive very long outside the cells because they're obligate intracellular parasites. Okay, so where do we find Rocky Mountain spotted fever being a problem. We do see a few cases of Rocky Mountain spotted fever here in Utah, but we don't have a lot of cases because we don't have a lot of ticks in Utah just because we're so dry here. But we do have a lot more Rocky Mountain spotted fever, especially in the southern states, Midwest, we've got a lot more Rocky Mountain spotted fever cases there, and that's just because they've got a lot more ticks there. And the reason it's got its name, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, is because the disease was first discovered in the Rocky Mountains. So that's how it got the name, even though it's actually not as common in the Rocky Mountains, as you can see. So, but the name stuck. The other bacterium that is in the same class as the rickettsia is Rhizobium. This one does not cause any human disease, but it actually is very important for us. So this one lives inside the root nodules that you can see on this picture on the bottom right. 
And these root nodules are found on plants called legumes. So any kind of bean plant, clover plant, peanuts, uh, those are all going to be legumes. So inside these little nodules on their roots, that's where these rhizobium bacteria will live. And their big importance is they're able to fix nitrogen. So what does that mean? So what they're able to do is they're able to take nitrogen gas from the air and they're able to make that into part of an organic molecule. So they're able to take that nitrogen from the nitrogen gas and use it to make part of an organic molecule. So we cannot do that. Okay, we can't do anything with the nitrogen gas that's in the air. So we have to rely on these bacteria like rhizobium to fix nitrogen for us. And then the plant will obviously use this nitrogen that's now in, in the organic molecules that rhizobium has made, and then the plant can use the nitrogen and make things with it. And then we eat the plant, or we will eat the animal that eats the plant. And that's how we get all of our nitrogen to make our organic molecules that have nitrogen in them. So we have a couple of organic molecules that have nitrogen in them that are really important. One would be nucleic acids like DNA and RNA. Those have nitrogen in them. And then the other one would be proteins. So that also has nitrogen in it. So these are very important. If we did not have these, we would eventually die off because we wouldn't have anything to fix nitrogen and be able to, you know, access that nitrogen gas in the air, we couldn't get to it, and we'd eventually run out of nitrogen to make our organic molecules. Okay, our next class of our proteobacteria is the beta proteobacteria, and again, you do not have to know this name. And I'm not going to ask you, like, which bacteria are in the proteobacteria, and I'm not even going to ask you, like, oh, or is Bordetella pertussis gram-negative or gram-positive? I'm not going to ask you that. Okay, but what I do want you to know, for example, Bordetella pertussis, what disease does it cause? So this would be important to know, uh, especially if you're going into healthcare. It causes whooping cough. And we're going to be talking about that one more later. Um, it's also called pertussis. So you can see the name of the disease it causes is right in the, the name of the bacterium. So that's, that's easy. So this is a respiratory disease spread through respiratory secretions. And you can actually see the bacteria will actually adhere to some of the cilia that line the airways and um, will end up causing some problems with those and paralyzing those and then uh, you have trouble clearing the mucus in the airways and it causes this uh, whooping cough. You end up coughing really hard and you cough out all of the air and then you have to take this big <gasps> inspiration to get the air in and it sounds like a whooping noise and so that's the name whooping cough came about. Okay, our next one is Neisseria gonorrhea, and you can imagine what that one is going to cause. So that causes one of our STDs, gonorrhea. I think I spelled that right. <laughs> okay, and then the next one, Neisseria meningitis. Yeah, you can guess what that one causes, right? That one causes meningitis. Okay, so just look at these names and they're gonna help you figure out what disease they cause. And we're gonna be talking um, about these later in the semester. And then here's just a, a picture down below of Neisseria gonorrhea bacteria. We've got uh, some white blood cells, these are some neutrophils 
and then go around and they do phagocytosis and so they've eaten the Neisseria gonorrhea bacteria and you can see them inside the, the neutrophils there.